Hey everyone, it's Lisa with Are You My Cousin? And it's time for our weekly YouTube slash Facebook Live because now I am actually, I have the capability to live stream in both places. So it doesn't matter where you're at, you can still catch the same show at the same time. So welcome, welcome to you guys. And as you can see on the screen, I have Mary Eberly with me, our DNA extraordinaire expert here. Um, because as you guys know, I make no bones about it. I don't teach DNA. I know enough to get myself along in the process, but not to really teach it. It's such a specialized field and we know that Mary is such an expert. So thank you, Mary, for joining us. Oh, thank you, Lisa. It's great to be here. Oh, glad. So you guys may, you've seen Mary before and you'll know she is coming on about once a month now, which is fantastic. We're really excited to have her doing that. So let's see who is here today. We have Michelle from South Carolina. Michelle, you're probably getting as much rain as we are here in North Carolina. <laughs> We're getting, a, it's a really rainy day here, guys. Hey, Mary Jane. And Dave's here. Hey, Dave. Um, Flo's here from Oregon. We have Bill from Long Island. So we're kind of crisscrossing the U.S. Um, as you come in, guys, if you, if this is your first time joining me on a live session, um, welcome. Welcome. Feel free to put a comment in the a question in the comment box because I do see those and we do try to make sure we answer all of those questions as they come along. So we'd love for you to be able to um, get your questions answered. Looking forward to if you are coming in and just curious where you're from, feel free to drop where you're from in the box. You can tell those who come with us because they they pop that in there first first thing. So um, it's just fun to see where everybody's from. So um, if for those of you new, I am sitting in North Carolina and Mary, tell everybody where you are. I'm in Madison, Wisconsin. Is it cold up there right now? It is. It is. Okay. <laughs> it's warm down here. Unusually so here. So we have Bill from Connecticut. Hey, Judy from Baltimore and Chad from Kansas. Hey, Catherine from West Tennessee. Yay. And Lee is from Pennsylvania. I see lots of names I recognize. Hey, Lydia from Michigan. So it's fun to see folks that I recognize um, on here as well. So guys, today we have, as you can tell, obviously we're going to be talking about DNA everything um nothing really new going on over on the website are you my cousin i would encourage you to check out this week's latest post it is a little different than probably what you're used to seeing me write um i did write a, a, a it was fun to write and I, i've gotten some really good comments back and i appreciate those guys um the post is about that it's basically experiencing genealogy as a multi-sensory type experience in other words getting away from our computer and using our five senses to to really delve into our family history and to be able to truly connect with that history because we spend so much time behind our computer and in those documents that sometimes i know that i forget to kind of make those connections and really sit back and think on those ancestors and when you do that not only is it a more rewarding and enriching way to research i almost always come away with new clues or new thought processes, new ideas um, in for my research. So I would encourage you to do that. So would love for that. Let's see who else have we got over here. Well, hey, Kathy and Lynn and Bobby. Oh, there are lots of folks popping in there. It's hard to catch up with them. They keep flying by. <laughs> hey, Lynette and Michelle. Um, so yes, welcome, welcome. Okay, Mary is here and we are going to be talking about autosomal DNA. Last time we talked a lot about the, was it maternal DNA, I think, and the Y DNA? Right. Yeah, we talked a little bit about autosomal, um, but primarily we talked about Y DNA, which is from your father's 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 line, and mm -hmm. mitochondrial DNA, which is from your mother's 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 line. Right. And it's, each one is very different. And I loved the analogy you used about the, the, different types of DNA and the book analogy that you used. I don't know if you're going to use that again today, but I'd love to share that with maybe those who haven't heard that because it just really helped to make sense when it comes to looking at the different types. And then we'll dive into that autosomal. Sure. Sure. So the book analogy is that Y DNA is like one cover of a book and the mitochondrial DNA is like the other cover of a book. And when you open up the book, you've got all of those pages in between, and those are like your autosomal DNA. 
And we also get autosomal DNA from that father's 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 line and your mother's 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 line. But this is, um, I use that analogy because it just is really good about, about showing you how much of you is autosomal DNA, how many branches of your family tree, plus just how much of our DNA is autosomal DNA. I thought that that was just such a, a really great analogy that really helped me kind of, it just kind of gave me that aha moment of now I get it now, you know, I kind of get that whole, why it is so important because we always, you know, I, I've been doing this as long, well, you've been doing it longer than I have probably as far as the DNA is concerned, but when it was just the Y DNA or just the maternal DNA type stuff. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So talk to us about the autosomal DNA. I mean, maybe just start with telling us actually what it is. Okay. It autosomal DNA is the vast majority of our DNA. It comes from our parents. We get half from our mothers and half from our fathers. Um, they got half from each of their parents, which means we get roughly 25% from each of our grandparents. And it's, it's going to vary a little bit starting at that grandparent level. So maybe you got 24% from one grandparent and 26% from the second grandparent and 25% and 25% from the remaining other two grandparents. Um, and then if you go up one generation to great grandparents, you are getting roughly 12 and a half percent from each of those. <coughs> and that, that's because at every generation, they're getting half from each of their parents. And that variability at the great grandparent um, is a little bit more than what we typically see at the grandparent. Um, it doesn't really impact the DNA testing, but just so you know, it's not exactly 25, 25, 25, 25, and mm -hmm. so on. And that, that DNA codes for parts of our body. So for example, your muscle cells, um, your neurotransmitters, which are chemical messages that your brain and body uses, um, you know, everything. And um, then we have the Y chromosome, which I've mentioned, and the X chromosome. Those are the sex chromosomes. We have either um, an X and a Y, um, like Lisa and I have, or I'm sorry, an X and an X, like Lisa and I have, or an X and a Y, um, like our fathers had. Because the Y is only going to men. So Lisa and I don't have a Y. We have two X's instead. And, um, you know, and of course, there's, there are things coded on those two other chromosomes. Um, but we've got 22 pairs of the autosomal DNA chromosomes, you know, just for some background. And that, that's where we get the 23andMe DNA testing company name is that right. in total, we've got 23 pairs. So Bill had a question. He said, how far can the DNA percentages skew from being evenly distributed? Well, it, you know, it, it, the further back in time, the more skewing there is. And what we're really talking about is, for example, how much DNA do we share with a second cousin? So a second cousin, would share great grandparents with you. And on average, you share about 220 centimorgans and centimorgans is just a measurement of DNA. Um, so on average, you share about 220 centimorgans with a second cousin, but uh, it could be much lower. So let's say 100 or it could be much higher. So it could be approaching 300. And there are, so there's this range of how much DNA you would share with a second cousin. And if you think about every generation, you know, from you to that ancestor, there are many generations. And then there are that many generations going from that ancestor down to your second cousin. Mm -hmm. So you've got all that variability, like added up every time, you know, you're, you're coming down one generation. Right. So if you're coming down off of, say, 
well, say like grandparents, and you get 25, roughly 25 from each one. It, would there ever be a, can, a, a case where you say 20% from one and you know 30% from the other? Would it ever be that big a skew, or is it usually just within a, a point or two? Um, you know, there's an excellent tool that would um, say exactly what people have seen, and that's the shared Centimorgan project. Um, okay. And um, but I would, I would say, like, if I had to give you a range, I would say maybe 23% to 27%. Okay. Um, at, for if you had your grandparent or your grandchild tested. And that's sort of what I've seen within, just within my own family, obviously, a very small, it's a very small sample, but that's kind mm -hmm. of what I've seen um, with my cousins. That, they're always coming up to me going, I tested, I tested. I'm like, okay, they had no idea. So many of my cousins had tested. It got, it got kind of crazy there for a while. So where where do you typically test? I mean, only I know not everybody, all companies test the same thing. So where would you normally go for that autosomal test? Mm -hmm. And I should start out by saying, you know, we see these TV advertisements for DNA testing. For example, 23andMe has a lot of advertisements. Um, Ancestry does also, and I've, I don't think I've ever heard the word autosomal DNA on one of those <laughs> commercials. You know, they just say, get your DNA tested with us. You know, it'll, you know, do all these amazing things. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're out there shopping for an autosomal DNA test is that all of the big four DNA testing companies offer it. They might not specifically call it out as that. Um, so we've got Ancestry, Family Tree DNA, and Family Tree DNA actually calls it their Family Finder test. Mm -hmm. And then 23andMe, any of their tests includes autosomal DNA, and um, MyHeritage also does autosomal DNA. And of those, um, Family Tree DNA does additional testing of, um, for example, Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA. Um, but the other ones, as long as you order their test, you're going to be testing autosomal DNA. That's what I say. And it's typically one of the, it's, it's a less expensive test as opposed to the, the, the mitochondrial DNA and the Y DNA, correct? Mm -hmm, correct. Yeah. So. Right. So, and right now we have some sales happening already for the holidays. Yes. And I will interject here, guys, if you want, and I'll find a link while she's talking. Um, I actually, I, Mary and I both, I'm sure, learn a lot about these sales that are coming ahead, um, sometimes ahead of time. So if you guys want to stay on top of possible sales coming up, I have an, e -letter, um, an email I send out every Thursday to people who sign up for it. It's for the frugal genealogy, and it's just all the um, sales that I see coming through, but um, I don't do that to the to the main list. So that if, if it's one you want, I'll pop that sign up for that very specific type of email into the chat box shortly here. Um, so you guys can sign up for that and I'll let you know when those sales are going on, and which is actually right now <laughs> is when they're going on. So um, wonderful. All right. So Mary, what information are we looking at when we test on those DNA, those, the DNA test? Um, so we get back an ethnicity estimate from those DNA tests, and we also get a match list. And the ethnicity estimate is um, informative, but it's the least accurate part of the results, um, especially after Ancestry and Family Tree recently tweaked their reporting of ethnicity estimates. It just seems like there's a little bit they need to work out where, um, I'll give you an example, which is, I'm working with someone of Ukrainian descent, and he had tested at every DNA testing company. He is, you know, 100% Eastern European, maybe a little Jewish matched, you know, in there, um, Eastern European Jewish. And now all of a sudden at um, Ancestry, he's like six or 12% Irish. You know, and I, I've worked on his tree. I, I know who his ancestors are. They are not people from Ireland. Um, so I'm not sure what happened. I, you know, there are a lot of doubters when it comes to ethnicity estimates. Um, I have always been a big supporter of ethnicity estimates because I have always found 
them to be useful. Um, so that's what I'll say about ethnicity estimates. Uh, we, we're also getting our match list and that's important. We're getting uh, anywhere from maybe 15 or 2,500 to 20,000 or more matches. Um, and those are people who have tested at the same company and they're matching us um, you know, for a certain amount of DNA. Mm -hmm. and that, that DNA list is arranged from your closest match to your more, most distant match. Okay, gotcha. So let me get back to that ethnicity the issue that you were talking about with, I know recently with Ancestry, I know I came back, they changed my, and I came back 25% Scottish. Well, to be honest, that's not really out of the realm of possibilities with my Ancestry, but that seems really, really high. Um, and so is it is it the kind of thing when things like that get skewed that heavily, do we just sort of wait and sit back until they update or resolve that or are they actually working on it or how does that what do we do with that area or do we do anything mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think for now we just sit back and wait um i had the same thing come up where um i have ancestors from england and now all of a sudden i have ancestors from scotland mm -hmm. you know where you can you can imagine that there's some crossover between the two populations mm -hmm. um and but I, but going back to that earlier example, it's like, well, I, I mean, I'm no history buff, but I'm pretty sure the Eastern Europeans and the Irish um, did not inter, you know, intersect in the populations. Um, you know, if you had a second great grandparent from Ireland, you then might have six percent Irish in your ethnicity report. Mm -hmm. uh, but having seen his earlier reports and um, looking at the DNA matches and building out his tree, there there is not a second great grandparent from Ireland. Right. Okay. So that really goes to the point that we hear a lot when you go to conferences or, or listen to people is that you really have to have your, it's not either paper research or DNA research. You want to use, you need to use them both together to catch those kinds of things. Definitely. Definitely. Yes, that's correct. All right. So we've got a couple comments flying in. Oh, hey, Jim. Jim's from London. We've gone international, guys. <laughs> um, so let's see. Yeah, Catherine said she got a lot of um, Irish when the Family Tree DNA did their update as well. Um, and Lydia had a question. She said, oh, no, sorry. Oh, Lydia, I'll put that new link in there. I, I'll test it out and check on it for you. Mary Jane said, what are the closest matches? numbers so i'm not quite sure what you mean mary jane can you clarify that she said she said what are the closest matches some of, i don't know if she's asking you'd clarify a little bit more about when you when you get your results back um exactly what that's telling you or not okay it would help to clarify yeah mary jane if you'll just pop that in again that'd be great all right so while we're waiting for her to do that um so how do you review matches? I mean, how are they reviewed um, mm -hmm. when the companies are looking at them or how should we, or not the company, but how should we look at them? Well, the first thing I do is I look to see how much DNA is shared with the match. And that is because from, from that, I can tell what the possible relationships are. And um, for example, if your aunt tested, then the two of you would share about 1700 or 1800 centimorgans and um if you didn't know that your aunt tested and all of a sudden in your match list you've got somebody sharing that much dna you know that is a possible aunt but it's also a possible niece or nephew um, grandparent or grandchild um, or half sibling so it's important to consider what are all of the different possible relationships? And there's some really good charts out there, aren't there? That kind of, because I, I mean, you can keep this in your head. I'm like, going, okay, yeah, I, I don't even remember. <laughs> so, I mean, are there, do you have a, I don't know if you have a link, this is putting you on the spot, or if you want to share it with me later, it's fine to go like a, just a good reference chart online that we can go to. 
Sure. There's a great tool called the Shared Santa Morgan Project Tool. And it's really nice because you can enter into a window how much DNA you're sharing with a match. And then it will tell you all of the possible relationships okay. as well as the likelihood of those relationships. Great. I, I will grab that um, email. I'll grab that address and pop that. Is that the okay. DNA? Is it DNA Painter? Uh, it's a. It's the t that tool. The Shared Santa Morgan Project is uh -huh. from DNA Painter. Okay. I just wanted to check and make sure I had the right one because of the the web address. I was like, that didn't look quite the same. So. Okay. Here, yeah. And guys, for those of you who are watching this on a YouTube replay, I will have this address, a website address. I will put this in the description below. So if you are watching on a YouTube replay, that's where it'll be because the comments don't necessarily come over on a replay, but on Facebook, you should be just fine. All right. Let's see. That sounds good. Um, who else? So Sherry said she had a big, she had a, a big time Scottish when she turned when that used to be English and Irish. Yep, it sounds like me, Sherry, definitely. The thing is, I actually do have Irish ancestors and it's, it's Scots Irish, so that wasn't out of the realm. Um, ALK says her father is no longer living. Would one of the brother's DNA be as good as her dad's would have been to complete that side of the tree? And I'm assuming she's thinking autosomal. Well, each of his children have half of his DNA in terms of autosomal DNA. Mm -hmm. And going back to the book, you know, if you're looking at your the father's half, so we've got, sorry, <laughs> we've got this mirror image thing going. But if you just think about one half of the book, that's from your dad, and you've got all of those branches. You know, for example, your father's mother, um, you received autosomal DNA from her. And um, each of you as grandchildren would have received 25%. But each of your siblings is going to receive a different 25%, but it overlaps. So there's some similarity. But the nice thing is that if you can get your siblings to test, you're just going to recover more of the parental or grandparental DNA. Um, and I, I'll, I'll just mention why DNA, because if we're talking about the father's 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 line, so that one book cover of your book, then you're right that you would want your brother to test. So he could test his Y DNA because that would be your father's Y DNA and, um, and, you know, and further up that chain. Yeah, definitely. All right. So we've got a couple in here that are about that back to that Irish Scottish issue. <laughs> Sherry was saying, Sherry was saying, you know, she had a big time Scottish uptick in that last rearranging. She's saying, should she retest? And what about Jed match? Um, Cause she has that the retesting really, I mean, they're just looking at it with the same algorithm. So retesting yeah. wouldn't necessarily be the thing to do. Right. I wouldn't retest. Yeah. And so she's asking about Jed match. Um, does that play any part into it or? So Jed match is a third party website and it, it accepts transfers of autosomal DNA results. And it's therefore it's this big database of people who have uploaded their autosomal results to it. And um, I should first give the caveat that law enforcement is using Jed match. Um, so you need to specify whether you want your sample to be matched to these law enforcement samples. And, and you do that in the setup. It's very straightforward. Um, but just so people know that's happening. And um, it, it can be nice because let's say you just tested at one place and you're thinking about testing at another place. And if you go into GEDmatch, then you can see if people from those other companies are matching you mm -hmm. because there's a way to decode their, um, in the old days we decoded their kit numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and today they give um, random numbers in the kit numbers, but there's a separate column that shows you where they uploaded from. You know, so let's say you, like, you tested at Ancestry, you're thinking like, oh, should I test at, 23 and me, will I get that many matches? Um, 
Well, if you upload to Judmatch and you can see you've got a whole bunch of brand new matches who came in from 23andMe, now it gives you a really good feel for, you know, it's probably worthwhile to also test at 23andMe. Okay, I hadn't thought of it that way before. That's that's a good way to think. Danny was sharing too that he had eight grandparents with Irish and German and Welsh. An ancestor gave, he had two Irish, two German and four Welsh. An ancestor gave 38% Irish, 36% Welsh and 9% German with the rest scattered. So it does kind of come off kind of a little skewed there with that whole um, different way of going about it. Bill said with his DNA, with his GEDmatch, he did DNA testing at two companies. Which one or both should he send to, to GEDmatch? Well, if you've tested at multiple companies, you can upload them separately. Um, but then it's important to, uh, at least for the time being, where you're online working, to inactivate one of them. And you do that by making that other kit a research kit. Uh, because sometimes we are getting a slightly different match list from our ancestry upload as we do from from our family tree DNA upload or or my heritage or 23 and me. Mm -hmm. So you can play around and you know maybe you decide, oh, the other one wasn't really worth it and delete it or you but either way, you should at least turn one of them into a research kit. And then, yeah, that way they won't end up in the match list of all of your matches as two of you. Um, because otherwise, you know, it's going to look like there are two of you. And that could be quite confusing. All right, let's go back to Mary Jane's question. And some of the question I was going to say, uh, and Jamie, I see yours and I'll come to that one in just a minute. So Mary Jane did clarify, hang on a minute, I got to go back up. It dropped down. She said, because this was about the DNA, uh, she said, when I see DNA numbers of connections. So her question had to do with the DNA. Her original question was about closest matches. And she was curious about when she sees the DNA numbers, numbers of collect connections. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure if that's um, like the, the matches you have in common, um, because that would be that would be the next thing I would do with a DNA match is I would look and see who they are, if I can figure that out. And then I would look to see who are the shared matches. So people in the database that match me and also match this other match. Um, so there's that number. Um, uh, so please let me know if, if I didn't answer the right kind of number question. Oh, you, she you said, had. yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Right. So it's interesting. Like um from for myself, I you know, I tend to have more DNA matches from my mom's side than from my dad's side. And then when I go to my dad's side, I've got more matches from my father's father than I have from my father's mother. And that could be due to family size or it could be due to um when people are recent immigrants, they, they're not, you're, you're not going to have as many matches in the database. Um, or it could just be my paternal grandmother's family didn't do DNA, DNA mm -hmm. testing, you know, for whatever reason. Um, you know, so you do, you know, it's not like 25% of your matches are going to be attributable to each grandparent. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. I hadn't thought about it in those terms, but you know, you're right. I think, yeah, I can definitely see there's certain lines off the, in my family tree that where those cousins definitely did more testing and others that are much less just they weren't interested kind of thing. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I definitely can see that. All right. So let me go back to Jamie's question because it was a really it was an interesting question. Let's see. OK, so the question is, will there ever be a way for transplant patients to use DNA science for genealogy purposes? I assume that, that 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 this is a bone marrow transplant question. Um, mm -hmm. I have DNA lab experience developing DNA tests for people that needed it, bone marrow transplants. Mm -hmm. So, um, in a bone marrow transplant, you're obliterating the patient's bone marrow, and then you're replacing it with a donor's bone marrow. 
And that means that all of the blood cells that are in that person are from the donor. Mm -hmm. And um, I would, I would say that if you did a DNA t test that was a cheek swab, you know, where you're putting in the little Q-tip thing into your mouth and scraping off cheek mm -hmm. cells, that that is going to give you the most likely um, DNA result based upon yourself. Because, oh. you know, the rest of your body is made, is still you, it's only your blood cells that are the donors. Okay. And in spit, we have um, some white blood cells. Mm -hmm. So that's where you can end up seeing the donor showing up. Okay. That, okay. I didn't realize that. That makes sense. Yeah. I, I, I had figured that the cheek cells would be okay, and, uh, but I hadn't thought about the other. So Jamie, I hope that helps. Um, that's, a, that's a really good dis distinction I wasn't as aware about. So yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. All right, we have lots of people who are losing different types of, of um, ancestry, <laughs> ethnicities. Oh, and ethnicity. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think that's just one of those things that just, it just happens. I can't say there's any rhyme or reason to it. And I think, you know, hopefully it'll settle back out pretty mm -hmm. soon. Mm -hmm. It's really what I'm hoping is that they'll figure that out and get it all kind of situated back out, so. Anyway, so here's a question. This actually, I had this conversation with uh, actually someone yesterday. It was about how many generations back do those autosomal DNA matches go, or do they represent? How far back can you go and be confident? Well, we're seeing DNA matches from five or more generations ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes it's even further back in time, and when when we're looking at the matches, we are um, having a, a threshold. Uh, typically, it's, well, seven or 10 centimorgans mm -hmm. where you're, you know, you're trying to decide, is this a real match or is it just a coincidence? You know, for example, we're both from the same county in Ireland, and therefore there's a lot of shared DNA. Um, or maybe it was a, a reading error on the computer when they were analyzing the DNA. Um, you know, the it's always important to see that you've got a tree and that you can make the connection. Mm -hmm. You know, it's even better if you can, um, if you see it in a parent and a child, because then it's more much more likely that that that, that piece of DNA is real. Uh, we, we call the uh, the different kinds of DNA segments um, identical by descent, which means it, it actually came to you, you know, through your gene your genealogy and your recent genealogy. Mm -hmm. Or um, the other kind is sometimes called identical by chance, where you know it's just that it's it's not a true segment. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, well, I mean, I, I use some more distant matches, you know, you're only sharing a tiny bit, but I wouldn't like base my whole hypothesis. I would, I would not support that by, you know, a single match that shares seven centimorgans with me. Mm -hmm. I would want to see the shared matches. I would want to see much more close matches, um, you know, it's just, I think, I think it's somewhere around half of those small segments aren't real. Yeah. So you really, you really need to be able to have, it's, it's, you're building a case at that point. It's, you can't just go with that one, that one match. I mean, you need to build that whole case. Mm -hmm. So well, that makes sense. Definitely. Um, I didn't realize you could go quite that far back um, generation loss with the autosomal. So that's good to know um, mm -hmm. to be able to do that. So. And what have you, what have you accomplished using your autosomal DNA? What, what kinds of fun things have you done? And then we'll head over to some more of those questions. <laughs> oh, sure. Sure. Um, well, I have done work for other people. Um, I have found birth parents of adoptees and other people with unknown parents uh, using autosomal DNA. You know, and a lot of times that's all we have. So for example, if you have a female adoptee looking for a birth father, 
she did not get Y DNA from him. She did not get mitochondrial DNA from him, but half of her autosomal DNA she got from him. You know, so it's a very useful tool. And I have found um, biological grandparents, great grandparents, second great grandparents. You know, I'm not sure at what point you talk about breaking through brick walls, mm -hmm. but um, you know, I think at least at the second great grandparent uh, level, you're breaking through some brick walls, and um, you know, and maybe even finding a, a birth parent. Mm -hmm. So, um, in my own family, I've have found a second or third great grandparent uh, from from Norway, and um, you know, just things like that. So it's a really powerful tool, and I use it in. I would say over 99% of the hours I spend doing genetic genealogy, I am using autosomal DNA. Oh, nice. Nice. It's, you're definitely well, well, I knew you did because you were well versed, definitely well versed in it. I don't know if I shared with you, I, I may have the um, recently what DNA did. Um, I guess I was part of a brick wall breaking. So I had somebody reach out because they matched me through Ancestry. And I had my tree there and they were, my second great grandfather had an, a, a child born out of wedlock who was acknowledged on our side of the family. He grew up, moved away to create, you know, have his own life, had a family and they had no idea who his family and his parents were. So they made this match. They reached out and I'm like, yeah, we know all about him and here's all about us. I mean, it was just a really, and they actually, actually called me on the phone. And, and so, um, you know, everything matched up, but they just had no idea who his father was until they just happened to do that test and we matched. And so she said, this mm -hmm. is the only place I can find that we match. I said, that's it. <laughs> so we uh, now have a whole nother side of the family. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, it really did. It was, it was really exciting. I was like, it's just like on TV. Anyway, <laughs> all right. So um, you can see the questions, right, Mary? On the okay, because there's some definitely uh -huh. some questions in the chat. Um, Sherry had another question about um, the Native American um, type of ancestry. I don't know, and that is one I actually get a lot: is is people trying to why are they not seeing it if they know that it's documented in the family, and why are they not seeing it? And my thought was it probably has more to do with the size of the database. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Um, there are many, many reasons for not finding it. Um, you know, everything from the person, the ancestor that was supposedly, um, a hundred percent Native American was actually, you know, three ace Native American. Mm -hmm. And with every generation you're, you're having that amount, you know, mm -hmm. you're one halfing it. And, um, you know, so you know, it could be non-detectable at the point where it's in you. Um, and another common one is just that it was a family lore mm -hmm. and um, it's not there. That would be um, our family. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my family too. Like, why do you have dark skin and why does grandma have dark skin? And why does, you know, like on both sides of my family, you know, there's this dark skin and, you know, and, my grandma was told when she was a little girl that they were going to give her back to the Indians. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, <laughs> she should have gone back to Norway or England really, or, right. you know, like that's, it's just the way it is. And yeah. And, and the, to speak to that, we, cause I mean, that, that story's on both sides of my family and, you know, this was told to children, but we're pulling our oral history from those children when they're grown up and they never had the real, they never got the real story sometimes, you know, kind of thing. So um, yeah, it was a real interesting. I realized when I realized I was actually hearing stories that were really actually children's stories that had been, you know, kind of just told to the kids in the family, but they were being relayed from my elders. And so, you know, everybody kind of assumed it was right. And I don't know if they're happy I disproved it or not, but anyway, I've disproved it on a couple sides now. <laughs> I think they're a little disappointed, but, um, but would it also be, cause I have a friend, she came to me and she's um, Native American, but it's a very, very small tribe um, up in New England, like Maine. And I wondered if it just was because they're just probably weren't, the, it was 
weren't that many who've tested perhaps maybe the database was just so small they haven't in fact, I can't remember. I mean, it was such. It's a, she said it's such a tiny trauma. I've never even heard of it. Um, so I just wondered if that might be part of it too. Um, well, it for ancestry, they have really improved their um, their reference panel, which is okay. the, the group of people that they are using to come up with the markers that are present in different tribes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've seen where people's results now say um, native Alaskan, you know, or, you know, okay. Inuit. Um, and they, they're breaking things down much more specifically. Um, in the past, their reference panels were all from South America. Um, mm -hmm. it, which now, clearly, they are not. And, um, you know, I, I see native... Um, groupings from Mexico, from Canada. So it's a much better, um, a finer detailed report that they now provide. Okay, that's really, that's that's nice. That's good to know. I'll have to pass that along to her. All right, so uh, back over in the questions, Jim said, is he right in assuming that when you match someone else in the ancestry and it says they share a common ancestor, and it shows the connection, at least that confirms your research. So if you, in other words, I guess if you've done paper, the paper search and then you match appropriately mm -hmm. DNA wise, that pretty much confirms. Um, I would say if you have a paper trail and if the amount of shared DNA is appropriate. Okay. And if it's not like your fourth cousin once removed. Okay. You know, just, just because that's where you're getting down to that seven centimorgan, 10 centimorgan um, level. And it's definitely evidence to support your hypothesis that so-and-so is your great, great grandparents. Um, but, you know, the whole like, does it prove is, uh, you know, technically does having a birth certificate prove that somebody's parents are their parents. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you that is not true because <laughs> I've worked with people whose birth certificates um, had their adoptive parents. Mm -hmm. I've worked with people whose birth certificates had like aunts and uncles. Um, I've worked with people who were, um, you know, just, you can imagine all those variations where, you know, somebody would think like, I've got the birth certificate. This proves that this is my great, great grandfather. And you really have to think about just analyzing all the pieces of evidence that you've been able to collect mm -hmm. and coming up with the conclusion and making sure that all of that evidence supports it. And if there's ev any evidence that is inconsistent, then you need to be able to explain it. Yeah. So. That sounds good. That sounds good. All right. I think we have time for probably one or two more questions. Bobby had a question. Oh, wait a minute. It's two parts. Let me find the two pieces over here. Mm -hmm. um, on family tree DNA, her her brother has 55% English and she has Wales and Scott. Oh, wait a minute. Hang on. Is it? All right, Bobby, I'm not sure. Somebody's got, do you see the two? Do you see the two I'm looking at, Mary? Is Bobby's got I don't know if it's brother or mother has 55% English and further down it says something in Wales and Scotland and you have 42% Irish. What's the difference? I don't know if I'm reading that right or not. Bobby, mm -hmm. do, you, do you understand what well, she's I asking? Can, I can say that um, before the last update, I have a brother who has tested at Ancestry and I've tested there and our ethnicity estimates were matching pretty well, but they, they did vary. Um, and after the most recent update, they are less similar, mm -hmm. you know, and because siblings share 50% of their DNA and not a hundred percent, you know, you're going to see differences, Yeah. but, um, I think right now they're beyond like the, our Norwegian shows up much better in my brother than it shows up in me. Mm -hmm. So, but, uh, but recently with the updates and the like confusion they've caused, I wouldn't read much into that. 
you know, yeah. we know we know that full siblings share a specific amount of DNA with each other, you know, because I guess people have thought like, wow, he he must not be my full brother because you know he's Irish and I'm Scottish, and you know that's that's not a logical conclusion. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, and last question. Catherine says, um, this is talking about match, match values. Does that mean a low match value if both the son, my son and me match that person? Okay. So we would have been talking about, all right, I have, to th I have to backtrack where we were thinking about that. So it has to do with, I, guess, I think, matching the, the lower cinemorgans. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably what we're talking about. Um, you know, a nice, well, I would add in that a nice thing to have is a chromosome browser, which of course Ancestry doesn't have. But if you're if you're at GEDmatch or if you're at one of the DNA testing companies where you can actually see the DNA segments that you're sharing and you're seeing that in the chromosome browser, then if you're looking to see, is that a true segment? and it sounds like it's in her and it's in her son. Then when you look at the chromosome browser, it should be in the same place. Okay. Um, but it sounds like, it sounds like that's what mm -hmm. is, is happening. Yeah. And that makes sense. I know I, I look at those on family tree DNA that I, where I've tested because you can, I can see exactly where they're, where they match or if they don't match in those same places. So, well, thank you so much, Mary, for coming. So guys, Mary is the, um, as you know, she's, she is the owner and creator of DNA Hunters. And she also has the DNA Hunter Society now, which is a fabulous new program that she's got going. And do you want to just tell a little bit about that briefly, uh, Mary? Sure, sure. We have the DNA Hunters Society and it's a membership and it includes, um, weekly master classes. So those are live one hour long classes on various topics like autosomal DNA um, is one of them. And then we have a library of videos. There are 17 different videos in there that people get immediate access to. And there are Q and A calls twice a month for an hour where people can ask questions about their DNA results. And there are also um, member discounts if they would like me to do their research for them. And then there is a community forum where people can ask questions and get answers from me and other people in the society. So it's got those five components to it. And uh, it would be great to have more people join us. We're a small close knit group right now. It's really nice to meet with people and to have that weekly interaction. And sometimes it's twice a week. Mm -hmm. uh, and to get these some of these more detailed questions answered is, is a really great place. And Mary has graciously offered the Are You My Cousin readers a, a coupon code. Um, it's holiday 14. Uh, I can't even talk. Holiday 40. Holiday 40. Um, for 40 percent off the um, $49 monthly price through November 15th. Um, so super excited about that. That's a, a great deal. So um it's time to start holiday shopping, guys. So you, if you want to get yourself a gift, I won't tell anybody it's for you. Just throw it on, you know, <laughs> in your Christmas shopping list, and we won't tell them who it's for. It's just, you know, um, you can gift yourself or somebody in your family, certainly. So anyway, well, thank you so much, Mary. I really appreciate you coming. Thank you guys for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate you taking some time out, and um, we look forward to having Mary again next month. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye.